Um, I would like to thank you to attend this uh, second uh, webinar. So this forum, as I told you, are done to maintain our educational platform interaction with our colleagues, surgeons, doctors, physiotherapists, nurses, and even with our patients. This forum, this forum, like the previous one, will be available to revisit at any time on our Digsbone channel. So please subscribe by pressing the button below for the support and any new future videos. In our second live forum, I'm happy to start with my colleague, friends, and Digsbone Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Philippe Landreau. He's an amazing French senior orthopedic surgeon specialized in knee, shoulder, and sport surgery. He has a global experience across the world and working experience in French, Qatar. And now he is leading our Digsbone team to drive this project to excellence. I will be moderating this session for any question you may ask to the chat thread during or after the presentation. So you need to register in YouTube and we will do our best to answer to all the questions. So Dr. Landreau, sorry for what happened and uh, you have now the microphone and let us uh, through your presentation. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, it showed one thing that uh, you and me, because I don't know where it's coming from, it's better to do a surgery than to uh, launch an IT company because this is not our job. So thank you for the nice introduction. And um, I will uh, start to share my, uh, my screen. I hope you see uh, correctly. I see correctly your screen. So uh, hello, everyone. So the the, the purpose of my uh, presentation is to uh, um, launch a discussion on about the meniscus root tears, uh, about the epidemiology, the diagnosis, and the treatment. In general, I think the majority of you knows that the, the meniscus lesion, I'm not talking about only uh, root tears, but the meniscus lesion, are a frequent cause of uh, orthopedic presentation, you know, in the, in the knees. And it seems, it seems to be uh, to represent between 12 to 14% uh, of the orthopedic presentation for the knee. So it's a very frequent uh, pathology. If we talk about the meniscus root tears themselves, they are less known because, you know, we discover and we were more interested in this uh, uh, lesion only during the last years. And, uh, but there is clearly an increasingly interest on this uh, pathology because we realized that uh, these meniscus root tears can explain uh, one part and the frequent uh, part sometime of a function, uh, dysfunction of the knee and early stage of uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, I have no conflict of interest with this uh, presentation and I would like to start my uh, presentation with uh, the presentation of two cases, which are quite uh, good illustration of uh, what are the consequences of the root tears after uh, on the on the knee? This patient is uh, two, these two patients were seen by myself a few months ago. One of them was operated, and you will see the the, the case. Uh, this one is a 55 years old uh, gentleman. He's a former basketball player, and uh, six months ago he started to uh, feel progressive left medial knee pain with swelling. The clinical examination roughly show a genuvarum, full range of motion, and the medial femorotibial joint line tenderness. If you look at on the X-ray, you can see that there is a collapse on the medial compartment, compartment of, the, of the left knee. So it means uh, early stage or even not early stage of osteoarthritis on this uh, left knee for this uh, young, uh, still young uh, patient. And on the MRI, you can see that there is a uh, on the medial meniscus, a vertical linear defect that we can see very well. Forget the cyst, which is in the middle of the tibia. It's uh, nothing to do with that. And uh, we can see this uh, vertical linear defect, which is typical, uh, uh, a typical lesion on the MRI assessment of um, medial meniscus uh, uh, root tear. If we look at on the axial view and the uh, sagittal view, we can confirm on the axial view that there is a high signal on the axial view, 
and the, the typical and the so-called ghost sign. Ghost sign means you don't see anymore the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. We see just uh, an empty space and uh, like uh, this is why we call that a ghost sign. On the coronal view, there is clearly a meniscus extrusion. You see that the meniscus, medial meniscus is not anymore in its place here. It's extruded, so the, this is what we call a meniscus extrusion. And you can very well, you can see very well on this case that the cartilage, this gray zone covering the tibial plateau, is absent in this area, which is roughly the place where the medial meniscus should be and should protect the medial meniscus. In addition, you can see the reaction of the bone, the subchondral bone. So this is something that uh, is uh, quite um, uh, typical and uh, illustrating the effect of the medial meniscus extrusion. We will come back on the biomechanics. The, the case number two is a 36 years old gentleman, recreational football player. He had a right knee injury four years ago. And the current complaint when the, I, I saw this patient in my clinic was instability, but no pain, no swelling. He had all the sign, clinical signs of uh, SCI rupture with a uh, Lachman and pivot shift grade two. And you can see on the uh, imaging assessment, uh, on the right knee, on the lateral uh, compartment, uh, in comparison with the previous one, you see that there is a collapse and the narrowing of the lateral femorotibial joint line. On the MRI, there is an extrusion of the lateral meniscus. A vertical linear image on the coronal here with already some cartilage reaction and, and subchondral reaction on the condyle that we can see on the sagittal view as well. During the surgery, this is what I found. You know, the, the meniscus should be here, so should be as attached here. And you see that the meniscus is not anymore. We can go back on the here to understand, you know, this posterior root should be attached here. So this patient at the root tier and Moreover, we can see that there is no more coverage of the meniscus on the tibial plateau with already some cartilage lesion. And when we try, of course, after four years to reduce the meniscus, it's very difficult to do a repair. So this patient, had, for those who are not comfortable with the normal aspect of the lateral meniscus, the lateral meniscus normally should cover the lateral part of the lateral tibial plateau. So we should not be able to see the lateral the part of the lateral tibial plateau. And in this case, we see that the lateral meniscus is uh, completely extruded, uh, decreasing the protection of the cartilage. And in this case, it was on the femoral condyle. So in both cases, we can see that, uh, and we learn with our patients always, in both cases, cartilage lesion, the body of the meniscus looks intact because usually when we have a problem of uh, meniscus and traditionally, it's after a total meniscectomy, but in this case, the body of the meniscus itself looks intact, but the posterior root is pathologic and the meniscus has some extrusion. In other words, the meniscus is not anymore correctly placed between the condyle and the tibial plateau. So everyone knows, I'm sure, that we have two menisci. We should say menisci. We can say meniscus in each knee. You see that on this right knee, seen from front, you see that the, the patellar tendon, which is reverted here, there is the lateral meniscus here and the medial meniscus here. The menisc medial meniscus uh, is the C shape and the lateral meniscus traditionally is the O shape, so more closed. And you can see that there is a connection of the root, one, two, three, four roots of each for the meniscus, uh, a strong correlation an anatomical proximity with the anterior cruciate ligament and posterior cruciate ligament. This meniscus play a huge role, and we know that for a long time, in congruence, to improve the congruence between the femur and the tibia, the stability and the load uh, transmission. And uh, when we do this uh, dissection, we, the discussion or dissection of the knee, once we have uh, removed and detached the capsular attachment of the meniscus, you can see that uh, it remained this uh, big anchorage of the meniscus on the tibia. So this one is a right knee with a posterior lateral view. So this is a lateral meniscus, this is a medial meniscus. You can see that the anterior part of the, the anterior anchorage of the medial meniscus is quite thin. 
but much more uh, thick on the posterior part for both meniscus and the anterior part of the lateral meniscus as well. And you can see that you can literally hold the tibia with the meniscus uh, due to the, the, the solidity and the, and the strength of the anchorage uh, of the meniscus on the, on the tibia. Actually, during this presentation, we will talk about the posterior root uh, and not anterior root, which is another topic. And the, the posterior root are much more frequent, but we can discuss anterior root uh, later on. What about the biomechanics? The meniscus, the meniscus roots convert and disperse the axial tibiofemoral loads as hoop stresses. So to be clear, uh, I hope I will be clear. So the when the, the femur is pushing on the tibia, in order to avoid a, a point, a contact point, which could lead rapidly to uh, osteoarthritis, the meniscus is a fantastic uh, fibrocartilage, which converts all this axial tibiofemoral uh, load in multiple hoop stress. So it was compared to a barrel in the past. It means that all the, all the meniscus is loaded and distribute the load and the weight. 50% to 70% of the medial and lateral compartment loads are absorbed by the meniscus. So it's huge. It means when we remove one meniscus, you can imagine the effect and the bad effect on the cartilage it can, it can happen. So what is the biomechanical effect when there is a, a meniscus root tear? When there is a meniscus root tear, the meniscus literally fail to convert the, this axial load that I described into hope stresses. There is literally an extrusion with a non-functional meniscus. And actually, usually we know, and it's classical to say that the, when there is a total meniscectomy, there is no more protection of this and transmission of this load. But now we know that the, when there is a complete posterior root tear, the peak contact pressure after this kind of root tear are similar to that after total medial meniscectomy. So I would like to insist to the fact that it was something that we didn't know in the past, but uh, this root tear, which looks not very important, actually has a huge effect and bad effect on the biomechanics of the knee, like a total meniscectomy, and we know what are the effects of the total meniscectomy on the knee. A rupture of the medial posterior root increased by 25% the peak contact pressure on the tibial plateau, and even more when it is a lateral meniscus, 50%. So you can imagine the effect when there is no repair with the modification of the, of the biomechanics, and you could see the two first cases that I presented to you are uh, typically the effect of the osteoarthritis that uh, can happen after this kind of uh, lesion. The lateral meniscus is a bit different than the uh, medial meniscus. There is, you know, the, the, the contact, the peak contact pressure, I come back on the previous one, are more important if it is the lateral meniscus. But fortunately, the, the, there is less extrusion in general because there are two meniscofemoral ligaments, um, and uh, the two meniscofemoral ligaments are attached, we can see, on this uh, draw on the posterior part of the lateral meniscus, and they are on posterior and anterior to the posterior cruciate ligament, and the, the ligament of Humphrey and Riesberg hold the meniscus. So it means when there is a rupture of the root here, for example, close to the, to the attachment, fortunately, the two meniscofemoral ligaments keep the lateral meniscus in a good position. Uh, there is another uh, specific uh, um, remark that we could do on the lateral meniscus. Uh, as you know, the, when there is a pivot shift after an SEL rupture, there is a increased displacement of the lateral tibial plateau. And we know now that when there is a, a meniscus root tear on the lateral meniscus, it increases even more the pivot sh shift because there is no more control of this displacement because the lateral meniscus is uh, more mobile than it is already uh, naturally. So now uh, what, what uh, we can uh, call meniscus root because we need to have some definition. And actually you can see that the first description was recent in 1991 by uh, Pagagni, Pagnani, sorry. He defined the, radial, uh, the, the meniscus root tear as a radial tear or radial tears 
within one centimeter of the meniscus root insertion or an avulsion of the insertion of the meniscus. Actually, the insertion of the meniscus are quite large. It has been uh, studied uh, in anatomy in the lab. So sometimes it's quite difficult to reproduce surgically the anatomical as insertion and attachment of the posterior root of the lateral meniscus and median meniscus. But you can see on this uh, image that the two uh, roots are quite close to the posterior couchette uh, ligament attachment. And this is one of the landmarks when we want to repair. There are two different, even if the, we can find a lot of uh, um, clinical uh, uh, scenario, uh, on a mnemotechnic point of view to simplify, I would say that uh, we can separate two kinds of patient uh, and uh, two kinds of scenario. Uh, knowing that the posterior root tears prevalence is quite important, 7% to 9% overall, when they are identified during the knee arthroscopy, and more on the medial part than the lateral part. If we talk about the lateral meniscus, usually this uh, lateral, posterior lateral meniscus root tears are consequence of an SEL tear or multiligament tear. So it's uh, in an acute uh, scenario in young population. On the opposite, the medial meniscus posterior root tear are uh, more in the context of degenerative lesion chronic in senior population. So, you know, young lateral due to uh, an injury, uh, older, senior, chronic uh, in the context of the degenerative. So it's important to separate both of them. Uh, Lapride will work a lot on the um, root tear, define the, uh, propose a classification for the medial meniscus root tear. Uh, the type one is a partial root tear. The type two, which is the most frequent uh, in our uh, clinical assessment is the complete radial root tear. And you can have a different type, you know, with a root tear with a bucket handle, an oblique tear into root attachment, or it can be even a root avulsion fracture, which must be absolutely repaired. Um, Forken and Peterson propose a classification specifically for the lateral meniscus, because I told you that the femoral meniscus ligament uh, are an important factor for stabilization of the posterior root. And they describe three types, so this, the type three being the one with the rupture of the femoral ligament, which increase, as I told you, the peak uh, contact uh, by uh, 50%, which is uh, very important. What about the symptoms? Unfortunately, it's not really specific. Uh, it's not like a typical uh, bucket handle. Uh, usually we find posterior knee pain or pain in full knee flexion with sometimes McMurray positive, sometimes a popping sound when people are kneeling. The classical catching, locking, and giving way seems to be less common for the root tears than the, the typical uh, uh, rupture in the body of the meniscus. So uh, in this uh, kind of uh, symptom, in the, even for the clinical assessment, we can separate the traumatic and the non-traumatic, as I told you. So the traumatic is in the context of ACL, of multiligament injury, so it's very difficult to suspect uh, lateral meniscus tear in this context. So it must be uh, always explored during the surgery and uh, on the MRI. And we can find a lot of uh, lesion on the posterior root of the media lateral meniscus. When this is non-traumatic, it's more in context, context of degenerative knee with posterior knee pain, pain and in full knee flexion, as I told you, with this popping sound. So it means in general, if we talk about the degenerative root tears, which are mostly on the medial part, medial meniscus, we should have a high degree of clinical suspicion. And there is one uh, scenario which is quite frequent. We know the various malalignment, older age, increased body mass index, uh, female sex, and uh, some uh, increased uh, osteoarthritis grade. And when we, come, when we find this kind of uh, person uh, complaining uh, knee pain, we should have a high degree of clinical suspicion to look at the particularly the posterior median meniscus root. What about the imaging? MRI is it the king for that with three main signs. And we uh, uh, will repeat what I told you about the first case, the first patient I show you. So the meniscus extrusion on the coronal view. And if you go back, you will see the vertical line. The, the high signal on the axial view here, this is a typical one and the famous ghost sign. But this is only and mainly for the medial meniscus. For the lateral meniscus, it's much more difficult. 
This is why it must be always explored at, uh, attentively and uh, accurately. On the MRI, you need to have a good uh, uh, radiographist and yourself to look at the MRI and to have a high degree of suspicion. And sometimes, even for the medial meniscus, it's not so obvious. This is one of my cases. One patient operated outside for an SCR reconstruction, and the patient was still complaining pain on his knee. And you know, on this uh, MRI, you can see that there is no real vertical lesion. There is no real uh, ghost sign, and there is only a small signal inside. And you can see that uh, when we, I went to the, in the joint, I will show you later to show, show you how we can uh, repair that. You can see that the meniscus was apparently okay, but when we grab the meniscus, we can see that there is a complete root tear of the posterior part of the median meniscus. What about the treatment? There is still a place of non-operative treatment for the elderly and in the context of advanced osteoarthritis. But uh, if we can avoid it's better, but if the patient is old with advanced osteoarthritis, of course, it's not anymore the, the same problem. Uh, we can do some meniscectomy, partial tear, or in case of osteoarthritis with locking episode, if there is a, a flap moving in the, in the joint. But in general, for people who are young or semi-young, I would say, the repair is the goal, should be the gold standard when the patient has a healthy knee. Healthy knee means you, if they don't have advanced osteoarthritis, no advanced instability or laxity, otherwise you have to correct in the same time. It's important to repair this uh, lesion if you want to avoid the osteoarthritis, which is a high risk. But we should consider the BMI, body mass index, and the malalignment. In other words, when there is a malalignment of the knee and the high uh, weight, body mass index, we know that the results are not the same and we need to address this uh, concurrent pathology. How do we repair? It can be, uh, I will not go to the detail because the majority of the attendees are not surgeons, but uh, it's interesting for you to know uh, roughly how we do. Direct repair, suture anchor repair, or transoceus. So first of all, we need to have a, an accurate uh, uh, vision and to know exactly where to repair the, the meniscus and the posterior meniscus root. And the, during these last years, some anatomical study help us to uh, see exactly where is the root, because you know if we don't put the fixation on the right place, we will not have the same effect. Roughly, we can say that if we summarize on this uh, draw, that the, the posterior uh, medial meniscus root is uh, a little bit more posterior than the lateral meniscus. So it means when we do uh, medial meniscus uh, repair of the posterior root, it's a little bit uh, more challenging on the medial part because the knee is quite tight sometimes. So the surgery is easier on the lateral part, but anyway, we need to have this uh, landmark with the tibial tuberosity, with the, the eminence, with the PCL, which are important. So I will not go into detail, but uh, I will show you. First of all, we can do a direct repair. You know, this one was uh, uh, lateral meniscus uh, the root tear, but uh, quite uh, far from the bone anchorage, the bone attachment. I had still some uh, uh, tissue on the on the root, so I could do a, a classical uh, all inside uh, repair, like we do a repair for any uh, meniscus tear. We can use a suture anchor repair, and this is the, it's the picture of our friend uh, Boris Poberaj, who published us in Vumedi. So we threw the, a posterior medial approach portal, you know. We can uh, fix directly with the manker, like we do when we repair uh, the cuff. Uh, tear or the instability when we do a bank out on the shoulder, we uh, use suture and direct uh, anchorage. It's possible for the medial meniscus, which is because I told you that the attachment is quite posterior. For the lateral meniscus, it's much more uh, challenging. It means that uh, in general, we use the transosseous repair. So we drill a, a small tunnel uh, in the tibia, reaching the correct place to uh, close to the residual stump of the meniscus tissue. And we use uh, some specific instrumentation, low profile, because sometimes it's very difficult to go uh, deep on the posterior part of the meniscus. We can use a single or a double tunnel. And this is an example of one of my repair. The, we, you see, we'll use a guide which is low profile. We are already at the deep part and posterior part of the of the knee. This is a medial meniscus, right knee. So we pass first the first suture, then it uh, allows to load. It allows us to load a very strong suture 
uh, and we can use this kind of loop that we can we call the cinch stitch because it appeared that uh, the biomechanically it's much more stronger than the simple suture. We pass the suture through the tunnel and we fix outside of the knee with the uh, under button. And we can, if we want, and I usually do that to be uh, safe and to uh, sleep well, to do a double fixation with uh, all inside suture in the same time. So now we have two suture and it's much better than uh, only uh, one suture which, which could be uh, damaged if there is uh, pressure on it. This is just to illustrate that the cinch stitch is coming from the way we attach the saddle on the horse. Uh, it's a very strong um, way to attach the, the meniscus and we use sometimes this kind of thing in the, in the shoulder. So another example of a double uh, passage, you know, with the band instead of uh, suture. So we have uh, a lot of possibility. It's a bit uh, challenging uh, surgery, but uh, we have uh, more and more uh, experience in this kind of thing. And now we can uh, repair in uh, good condition. What about the post-operative uh, management? Uh, I would like to uh, bring your attention on the fact that uh, uh, this post-operative management uh, should be based on the good sense and the rationale that uh, uh, if we put the pressure of the condyle to the tibia, which means uh, the weight bearing, or in the full flexion for the posterior part, you can imagine that uh, this condyle will push the meniscus later, laterally or medially, it depends if it is a medial or lateral meniscus. So obviously, if there is a pressure on this axial view, you can see how there is a pressure on the meniscus, it will push away the meniscus and it will push the, the, and it will pull on the suture which are used here. So it means for this kind of repair, which is not the case for the peripheral repair of the meniscus where the weight bearing is allowed, no weight bearing is, uh, um, Adv uh, advice and recommended at the first uh, weeks with no more flexion than 90 degrees. So it's quite controversial because, you know, a lot of people uh, propose different protocol, but in general, we can say that there is a consensus to say that for the, the repair of the posterior meniscus root tears, the non-weight bearing is recommended between four to six weeks, depending on the team. I prefer six weeks to be on, a, uh, to be on the safe side. The flexion must be limited to 90 degrees between two to six weeks as well. The leg press and squat uh, should be limited initially to avoid overpressure and to push uh, away the meniscus. And the return to sport is usually after only six months because we must be uh, safe and prudent. For an SEL reconstruction, when we do medial me lateral meniscus uh, root repair in the same time than the SEL reconstruction, it's not a big deal because anyway, the patient will not go back to play before six months. When it's a medial meniscus without any other concurrent uh, pathology, sometimes it's difficult to convince the patient that, uh, because you know, he will tell you, oh, my cousin or my friend, he had a meniscus repair or even a meniscectomy. He, can, he went back to play a sport in three or four weeks. We have really to explain to the patient that it's a special case. There is a high risk for osteoarthritis in the future and they should be prudent and not return to sport uh, before uh, six months. So what are the evidence in 2020 about this uh, posterior uh, meniscus root uh, tear and repair? First of all, what about the natural history? It's clear that uh, there is a consensus. We know that the natural history of the meniscus root tears is particularly poor. And even sometimes it's uh, uh, really uh, scary when you see this, uh, this paper from Arner and his team, up to 28% of the patient undergoing total knee arthroplasty at a mean of 3.2 years after initial diagnosis. So this is really scaring. So it means it's uh, equivalent to a total meniscectomy. What about the, the study uh, uh, comparing repair versus meniscectomy? Uh, there is an evidence to repair because 30, in this study, 35% of the partial meniscectomy group underwent conversion to total knee arthroplasty compared with 0% of a repair group at five years follow-up. So we must repair this uh, meniscus root when we, when we are in a good uh, condition. The outcomes are good. Clinically, people are happy and uh, we have good clinical results in 96% of patients. I'm talking about clinical outcome, but we must be modest because you know, the BMI, for example, play a big role and it's particularly a problem because we know that uh, some people have a high risk of uh, this kind of uh, meniscus root tear when they have uh, overweight. And this study show that at minimum two years follow-up, 
the patient with a BMI greater than 35 kilo had the higher rate of repeat surgery. Imagine 25% versus 0% and a higher proportion of patients with clinical osteoarthritis at the time of the final uh, follow-up. So clearly the BMI is, the, is a concern, is a problem, and we need to address that or to be more prudent when we do that uh, when the BMI is high. Some study has compared uh, the, and the study the effect of the osteoarthritis and the meniscus root tear. This study, for example, in 2009, showed that to compare the, the tear gap and the severity of the osteoarthritis with the meniscus extrusion. And they show that uh, the greater tear gap, so it means the displacement of the meniscus after tear, uh, on the, after tear on the, on the MRI, is associated with an increasing meniscal extrusion, which makes sense. But additionally, the severity of the arthritis is associated with the increasing meniscus extrusion. So it's clear that there is an interrelation between all these kinds of things, and the chondral wear and the severity of arthritis tend to be significant worse when there is a displaced meniscus than the non-displaced group. So it shows and confirms the protection role of the meniscus on the, on the knee. Uh, what about the comparison with, uh, on the osteoarthritis between meniscectomy and root repair? In this case as well, we show that there is less osteoarthritis when we repair than when we do meniscectomy. So again, the message is to repair the meniscus root. And something which is very interesting and uh, uh, not expected probably, some people are even show an interrelation between the osteonecrosis of the knee, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee, and meniscus root tear. And so some people even think that uh, when there is a, a meniscus uh, root tear, there is an increase of a contact pressure and create an environment from, uh, for uh, insuffi what they call insufficiency fractures on the medial condyle, which could lead to osteonecrosis. So you know that the effect of the posterior meniscus root tear is even probably more than we could uh, think uh, uh, so far. So in conclusion, I would like to uh, summarize to say that um, the main message, the first message is that the, the posterior meniscus root tears must be identified. It's a really a, a, a frequent misdiagnosis. And unfortunately, when it's a misdiagnosis, as the symptoms are not so uh, important, we see sometimes patients after uh, two, three, four years after, with uh, early osteoarthritis that we could avoid if the diagnosis was done um, previously. So it means high level of uh, suspicion should be uh, our uh, behavior in front of uh, knee pain or knee uh, dysfunction. The lateral meniscus is more happen, the lateral meniscus posterior uh, root tear happen more in the concept, in concept of acute injury with ACL tear and, menis, and uh, uh, multiligament injury. The increase of the pivot shift, the notion of meniscofemoral ligament makes this uh, lateral meniscus a little bit special and it's more in the concept, con, con, the concept and the context, uh, sorry, of uh, ACL reconstruction. So you can imagine that each time I do an ACL reconstruction, I go to explore uh, the four roots, but particularly the posterior lateral meniscus. And uh, if you uh, don't look at that, you will miss a lot. The medial meniscus is more in the context of osteoarthritis, a chronic problem with uh, more senior people. So the extrusion, the imaging assessment must be, must be uh, accurately evaluated to uh, suspect and to find and to um, identify this medial meniscus root tear because if we treat them early, we can probably avoid osteoarthritis in the in the some of our patients. And I will conclude simply by that the repair is uh, highly recommended to avoid osteoarthritis if we want to protect the knee of our patient in the future. Thank you for your attention. Hello. Do you hear me, Philippe? Yes, perfectly. Perfect. Thank you for this amazing uh, presentation and talk uh, about the meniscal root. So we will start with the question. So the first question I had, it's coming from Dr. Ahmad Kanjo. He asked you more about the meniscus. What is the optimal time to athlete meniscal injuries, it means soon after the injury, or it's better to wait 
that the acute stage is gone. Sorry, it was cut a little bit. Can you ask the question uh, one more time? So, okay. He asked, what is the optimal time to treat a meniscus an injury to an athlete? So uh, yes, it's a good question because it's something which happens frequently in athletic population. So you have two, uh, two scenarios, I would say. The first one is the, the posterior meniscus root tear in the context of uh, SEL rupture or even multiligament rupture. In this case, when you uh, do uh, the diagnosis on the MRI, you know that there is no urgence to repair and to reconstruct the SEL usually, but probably in this case, we should not wait too much. And um, for me, I don't want to do more than six weeks if we can uh, uh, operate the patient, because uh, probably if the root is displaced, and you know, we will end up with the situation that I show you, which was four years after, of course, but six weeks is a reasonable time. And we, there is no evidence for that. Maybe we can wait uh, until three months, but the message is to say, avoid to wait when it's a concept of, of uh, SEL. When it's a medial meniscus uh, acute uh, traumatic tear, because it happened not only in the concept, uh, in the context of uh, degenerative and chronic, in athletic population, it can happen. I show you one of the cases like this. Again, uh, if we can avoid to wait more than uh, three months, I would say in the worst scenario, and probably six weeks is better, we can uh, repair the meniscus in good condition. We don't have to operate urgently in one week or two weeks, but six weeks is probably the optimal time in my experience. Perfect. So thank you for that. So now two questions coming from Elfie. Uh, first one, um, what to do if there is an asymptomatic meniscus tear? Uh, this, uh, this is, but first of all, normally, this is a good question because the, med, the some of them are asymptomatic. This is a problem. So when you see, when you recognize, and we do the diagnosis of a, a meniscus, posterior meniscus root tear, which is asymptomatic, it's because you do an MRI for another no reason. So if it is, again, in the context of ligament, we do the same treatment. If it is because you found this uh, lesion if you, uh, during uh, assessment of something else, uh, patellar femoral syndrome, if you do an MRI for that. In this case, if you confirm that it's a complete tear, I'm talking about the complete tear, we should repair because we have enough evidence in the literature to show that uh, a non-treated posterior men meniscus root tear leads to osteoarthritis after a while. So if, even if it is not after one year, it will be after three years. So yes, we should repair. So. And her second question was, how can you prevent an acute injury in a recreational athlete? You cannot prevent. We, we, we cannot prevent. It's like the, uh, probably we'll find in the future, like we uh, did for the ACL, some, uh, some program of uh, prevention. But I believe that um, for posterior meniscus root tear, you know, usually the, the lesion, the mechanism of injury is a hyperflexion and uh, uh, probably this is a reason why we have a lot of case here in Middle East, because you know, for a cultural reason, uh, people are in uh, kneeling very frequently and sometimes they report a history of a popping sound, you know, and then you have to be, uh, to have a high suspicion if there is some slight pain to avoid, uh, uh, to uh, miss the diagnosis. In terms of prevention, I don't think you can, uh, ask people to stop their uh, cultural uh, uh, behavior and, uh, and way of life. But uh, in the context of uh, sport, uh, so far, we don't know what kind of pre prevention, except uh, to have a good uh, muscle strength like any, uh, in, in any sport, uh, for uh, example, for prevention of any injury. Perfect, perfect. Now I have a question about from Faraz. So it's really interesting because he just uh, discussed about the last editorial of uh, Journal of Orthopedic and Related uh, Surgery about the meniscal root tear. So his question was, if a surgeon is aware that patient may develop progressive degenerative change at the knee in the future, how would you decide which meniscal root are treated surgically and which are treated non-surgically. 
So it was cut a little bit again, but uh, I, I, so I, so I repeat. So this article say, uh, discuss about uh, yeah, the high rate progression of osteoarthritis from the uh, lubomystic yeah. to me. So the question was, how do you decide which patient will have a meniscal root repair or not? Um, I, I would be very uh, aggressive, to be honest. I'm not talking about the partial tear because partial tear, there is no high risk of displacement of the posterior root. When, when, there is, uh, when you have the criteria on the MRI of complete tear with this uh, linear lesion, the, with this ghost sign and this uh, lesion on the axial view, I believe that we should repair because we know already that uh, it will not go uh, well in the future. Yeah, thank you. So another question from uh, Wissam. He asked you if you operate uh, symptomatic athletes with having root tear. I think it's obvious, but yes, for all of them. But th this question could be interesting for the if we, if we can, you know, there is a because. I ask myself the question uh, in my practice, when there is a 60 years old gentleman or lady with a root tear and uh, already some degenerative lesion without malalignment. This is where we don't have evidence because you know, um, I operate one, one patient like this recently because he was very active and uh, he had a displacement of his uh, medial meniscus with some early stage of osteoarthritis. Uh, I believe that uh, to protect the cartilage, if it is still possible to uh, uh, repair the posterior root and to recreate this uh, protection of the cartilage, I think it's better than uh, anything. And it probably, it's a simple surgery. It's not a complex surgery. The, the only disadvantage is the non-weight bearing during six weeks and the, the, the post-operative evolution. But with this patient, 60 years old, very active, it was easy to uh, manage the post-operative uh, 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 protocol. So, you know, we go even uh, quite late in the age and not only for the athletes. Mm, perfect. So question from Abelou uh, about your first case, really interesting because he observed that the patient has a virus, deformity, malign, yes. cartilage lesion and subchondral yeah. edema. His question is, would you offer a high tibia osteotomy at the same time that the root repair? So I was expecting this question. Yes, of course. Uh, I didn't show you because I didn't operate the patient because he, he said that he will think about that. Uh, you know, he had pain starting six months ago. I saw him uh, two months ago, I think. And uh, yes, if we treat only the meniscus root tear, we treat only one part of the, of the problem. He has already osteoarthritis and he has a virus alignment, few degree. So for this patient, in the past, I would say, I would do only high tibial osteotomy to answer the question. But now, as there is a root tear, I will go in the same, my first treatment is high tibial osteotomy to unload the medial compartment, sure. Because if you don't do that, uh, it will fail. But uh, in the same time, I will go to, uh, during the surgery to do an arthroscopy to assess the lesion. And if the meniscus is uh, repairable, it's okay, I will repair it. If it is not repairable, I will let the high tibial osteotomy uh, make the positive effect on the osteoarthritis. But it's in that sense, you know, at this age, 55 years old, it's not an occasion to repair because we're already osteoarthritis, so we are in the same context than the, the classical uh, medial uh, femorotibial uh, osteoarthritis with virus. The first treatment is high tibial osteotomy at this age. But now, with the knowledge that we have, why not to repair the medial meniscus if it is possible, knowing that with the high tibial osteotomy, you would not put the patient in full weight bearing immediately. It would be partial weight bearing. So it's not... Uh, it's not a big deal to do a posterior media meniscus root uh, repair. Again, if you can, because you know, when it's too old, uh, you cannot reduce the, the meniscus. Yeah, perfect. Another question from Kay Jordan, that thank you for this great talk. Um, it is interesting that one of your cases presented with no type of feeling of instability. 
So for, do you see many patients with wood stair presents without only instability, with only instability? Uh, sorry, sorry, because it, it was cut again. Oh, the, uh, the, the beginning of the question, yeah. The beginning of the question, she discussed about your case when you present the patient with no pain and the feeling of instability. And she asked if you see many patients with root tear and uh, uh, only instability. Okay, so this patient has an instability uh, a symptom because he had an SEL tear from the beginning, so we cannot judge. Uh, but to answer to this question, because this is a big point, usually, you know, in the classical uh, uh, medial meniscus tear with a flap, uh, you have some uh, symptom of, uh, you know, catching, locking, instability episode. With the meniscus root tear, we don't observe that. We, we observe that very rarely. So uh, again, it makes the diagnosis quite difficult because the, uh, the, this patient usually have a vague posterior knee pain or medial knee pain, not very important. They don't have locking usually. They sometimes you can uh, um, find during the discussion with the patient in the history some popping episode, but you know, popping episode is so frequent that it's not uh, specific. So the, the clinical diagnosis is not so easy. So this is why you, you should have a high, uh, high level of suspicion for that. Perfect. So question for the top that I think is a sports uh, physician because how can we convince athletes coaches, administrator to go for meniscal repair when the time to return to sport is over six months. Yeah, and this is the problem in general for the repair, not only for the route. Alors, first of all, <clears throat> there is a way to, um, to convince the people because, you know, uh, it's not uh, on one side meniscus repair and the long process, and in, on the other side, many sectomy, and three weeks after, they go back to, uh, to play. Because we have a lot of cases, not all of them, of course, a lot of cases of uh, many sectomy, which not, are not going very well. And they take a long time to recover. They have swelling and so on, particularly for the lateral meniscus, of course. Yeah. So I think to convince, we are convinced. We know that which, which is better for the patient as per the, the evidence and the research that we should repair. But I know that it's a problem sometimes when there is a high competition or a, uh, you know, a, um, uh, a big uh, event that they cannot miss two or three months after. Uh, it's a case by case decision, but for a posterior root tear, if we do a meniscectomy, we will remove all the posterior part which uh, hold the meniscus in place. So we should uh, convince the coach and, uh, and not the sport physician because they are convinced, the coach and the player, that if we don't do that, he will be good few months, but his knee can, be, can degrade after six months or one year, and then we cannot do any, anything else except uh, meniscus transplantation, which is another uh, story. Yeah, it's really, and then it's longer. So I have uh, Faya with two questions. The first question is, uh, if there is a meniscal extrusion with root avulsion, would you augment the meniscal root repair with central stabilization? Uh, actually, it's, it's not like this. Usually, it's, uh, it comes or it doesn't come. So uh, if I understand the sense of the question, if it doesn't come as the case that I show you, you know, with the grasper, you cannot uh, reduce the posterior root. Maybe in the future we'll do a graph, but it doesn't make sense because the problem is the extrusion. So uh, the, the, the objective of the surgery is to put back the root in its place, but mostly to uh, reduce the extrusion. And uh, unfortunately, when there is already an extrusion, usually it's too late because the soft tissue doesn't uh, don't allow the reduction of the median meniscus in its place. Maybe in the future, and it's a good point, maybe in the future we can, uh, we will release maybe the peripheral part of the medial meniscus or the lateral meniscus in order to uh, facilitate the reduction of the meniscus because anyway, it's always better to use the own meniscus of the patient 
than to go immediately for a meniscus transplantation, which is um, allograft. Yes, it's uh, again something. So the second question of uh, Faya, in which degree of flexion will you fix the root when you use the transverseus fixation? Uh, I'm, I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, 90 degree, 70 degree, 70 degree usually. But I don't think it affects a lot. Uh, I know, uh, I understand the question. Um, 70 degree because first of all, in extension is quite difficult to uh, manage. And uh, if we put in, uh, in uh, 70 degree in, uh, flexion, I hope it can be a sort of intermediate uh, uh, position of the knee that uh, avoid any over tension in full extension and in full flexion. But again, there is no evidence for that. No evidence for that. So. Another question, the indication, uh, to summarize, the indication depend on the sports level, the age, the career, and the club competition schedule. So it means uh, the timing during the season. Mm. You agree oh with yes. That? Yeah. So it means the question is uh, if there is a, uh, we are in the in, in the middle of the season, can we wait? Exactly. You said oh the better mm -hmm. is to operate this within six months, six weeks. Sorry for that. But you have a high level athlete, thirty five, and it's the mid season. Yeah, it's a mid season for for this kind of. Uh, it depends the importance, but usually it's important, of course, because they have the their agenda. In this kind of uh, patient, this is where I will I will push maybe three months, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, because I said six weeks is optimal, but it can be three months, four months. Every case is different. So again, uh, we don't have study showing uh, that uh, we cannot reduce the meniscus after uh, this amount of time. It's uh, mostly based on the experience and the good sense. Yeah. But we can still wait three or four months, but I don't think we should wait uh, a full season because the, we compromise the, the the result and the quality of the surgery. Yeah, totally agree. So uh, I have a question. So they are following all your case. So Harsh Vadgama propose uh, discuss about the case too. He said, okay, on this case you have an extrusion of the meniscus and a cartilage grade three lesion of the medial femoral condyle. He asked you if you will do some uh, radiofrequency chondroplasty associated with this uh, meniscal repair. Uh, first of all, it's interesting to, uh, to, to see that it's a grade three. So it means, uh, okay, not grade four. Grade three, if there is a varus, because we talk about the medial compartment, I will do a high tibial osteotomy, which is uh, probably the, the most efficient uh, procedure for this uh, patient. I will not do a radio frequency because I don't believe in radio frequency for the cartilage uh, uh, injury. If it is a grade four, sometimes we can do a, a micro drilling because I prefer micro drilling now than a micro fracture. So this is my answer, but uh, uh, radio frequency is not uh, routinely something that I do, particularly for the grade three. Okay, perfect. So. Uh, I will finish with uh, one last question from me. So what about the uh, anterior roots? Uh -huh. <clears throat> so uh, yes, we, we uh, separate the posterior root and the anterior root. Why? Because the two posterior median and lateral uh, roots are something that we discover recently. And we uh, know now that they are uh, playing a role in the early stage of osteoarthritis if non-treated. Now, if we talk about the anterior roots, the medial anterior root, there is never a lesion. So we should never say never in medicine or never say always, but we, we don't see isolated, I'm talking about isolated anterior root tear of the medial meniscus, or maybe if it happened, it's a, you know, a case to be published because for biomechanical reason, it's not a uh, load like it, it could be load for a, a lateral meniscus. Practically, the uh, anterior lateral meniscus root, yes, are part of something that we know for a long time, and we have this, described that for a long time, but the lesions are not like for the posterior root. They are not isolated avulsion, usually, or a disruption of the anterior root. They are more complex lesions 
of the anterior lateral meniscus. And it's another topic. So this is why we always separate the posterior root lesion, which are happening in some context, and the anterior uh, lesion, particularly the lateral anterior root of the, of the lateral meniscus, which are uh, more uh, traumatic or, um, or degenerative sometimes. So, no, thank you. Thank you, Philippe. It was really an amazing to topic for something really difficult. So, respect on our, our so yes. thank you for that. And I think we can introduce uh, the next topic if you want. Yes, next topic, we will have the very interesting topic. It will be the scapula dyskinesia. Uh, by uh, Dr. Thierry Monfils. He has a huge experience in this uh, pathology and he's a specialist of EMG working with us in uh, the X-Bone. And I think he is the best person to talk about this uh, dyskinesia to know uh, is it the cause, the consequence of the pathology. And we, need, we know that scapula dyskinesia is something quite difficult to uh, recognize or at least uh, to uh, manage. And yep. uh, I'm sure we will learn a lot with him. It will be like the meniscal root. It's something really difficult to manage. Thank you for all the information you give to us and see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.